My name is Wendell Affield. I am from Solway, Minnesota. I enlisted in the Navy in 1965. Um, went to San Diego for boot camp. It was late winter and I thought I want to see the sunny shores of the, Cal the Pacific. I had never seen it so I went to San Diego. Uh, went through boot camp, got assigned to a ship, the USS Rogers. And we, I was a boatswain mate on there. I started out as a deck seaman. Uh, I remember we went first up to San Francisco and how very seasick I was. Um, took us about a week to go from San Diego to San Francisco because we were doing some training operations. And I remember I was aft lookout, topside, and there's not much you can goof up when you're an aft lookout because you've passed everything. And I remember my first duty when we anchored or tied to the wharf in San Diego or in San Francisco was to scrub the side of the ship where I had vomited all over it. <laughs> oh, that was my introduction to sea life. Uh, shortly after that, we, we uh, went out to Hawaii again on a training cruise. And it was, must have been late 65, I believe. We were in Honolulu on Liberty and we were in this little outdoor cafe and all of a sudden this big motorcade came cruising up and they slammed on the brakes and a secret service man jumped out of a big black limousine and he ran to an ice cream stand, kind of like a Dairy Queen right next to where we were sitting and grabbed an ice cream cone and jumped back in while well, we discovered later Lyndon Baines Johnson was in that limousine and he must have been wanting some ice cream. He was there to, to have a conference with President Key of South Vietnam. Uh, um, we, we spent a couple of weeks in, in, in the Hawaiian Islands. We went up to Kauai uh, where I believe was Admiral Perry first visited and we, went, we were there for a festival. We returned to San Diego and I went to a couple of training schools um, I discovered I really enjoyed being on a deck force, the diverse duties and whatnot. And I was selected to go to a pilot rescue swimmer school and that was a challenge. There were about 35 of us that started the school and by the end of the week there was I believe five of us left because we we spent about 15 hours a day in the water. Oh, yeah. And and it was it was interesting training. We had to swim through parachutes and we ended up going, I spent some time on a Kitty Hawk learning how to release the cockpits, the canopies from jets and whatnot. So that was kind of interesting. Um, later that summer, or in the autumn, then I was assigned to the ship's landing force party and got to spend some time with Marines at Camp Pendleton up in the hills and that was fun because when, as a kid we used to play, my brothers and I used to play war, well here we were playing war with, pretend war with real old M1s. And that was kind of a blast. We did that for a week and, and uh, it was probably December of 66, I believe, that we deployed on the destroyer for Vietnam. So... Where'd you go in Vietnam? Um, uh, our main, where did I go in Vietnam? Our main project there, I think our main mission was to do to follow aircraft doing a pilot rescue guard. Uh, we'd follow the, the aircraft carriers up in the Tonkin Gulf. I never actually had to go into the water for a pilot because the helicopters from the aircraft would get there first. We did witness a couple of planes get shot down. They, they were hit and they were always directed from what I recall to try and get back out over the water. That was their best chance of being rescued, which I'm sure it was. Um, but after a few months, we, we would be online for, my gosh, over a month, as I recall, on patrol. And we went uh, to Philippines once for R&R. &R. We spent about a week there. And then we went to Japan another time and to Hong Kong another uh, for another R&R. &R. Uh, Towards the end of our of our Westpac, that's what it was referred to, Westpac cruise. It's a West Pacific. Um, it was kind of synonymous with Vietnam. But we did a lot of uh, fire support for the Marines just south of the DMZ. The what do you mean by fire support? Uh, they call in fire missions, and we would we would then. I was a pointer in a uh, five inch thirty eight gun mount, and 
mostly it was all electronic, so all you had to do was watch the gauges. But the Marines needed some uh, help if they were in an ambush or if they were on an operation, and uh, that was our fire support. We would help. We would they'd call in fire missions, and our our gunfire would be adjusted. From the, how far was the from, ship from the shoreline then? We were, as I recall, maybe three miles offshore. Yeah. And with the 5 inch 38, I forget the exact range. I want to say it was maybe seven or eight miles. Yeah, if that. And naturally, the further out, then uh, less accurate it was. Um, uh, years later, or a couple of years later, I came to realize that fire support how risky it was because we ended up getting some friendly fire when I was on a riverboat. So that was a different experience. So that's that's how I spent the first the early part of my four years in the Navy. Um, when we were done with our Westpac service, I we went to Japan to offload all the ammunition that was left on the ship. And it was just a Wait full a why do you have to take the ammunition off the ship? We it, it was because it was already had been hauled across the Pacific, it was best to leave it there for other ships. We offload to a supply ship in Yakuska. And so it was a, the full ship's party, 300 men, offloading this ammunition, just a constant chain, like a bucket brigade. In the old days, you'd go through the magazine and grab a powder casing or a projectile and carry it to the supply ship. Um, I had really, really bad stomach pains, and, and they discovered I ended up having ruptured my appendix. So they put me in a hospital at a naval base in Yakuska for uh, uh, emergency surgery, and I missed my ship back to the United States. So after about a month in Yakuska, then I, did, I flew back to the United States, and I was um, stationed. I got transferred to new construction ship up in Bremerton, Washington. It was called the USS Gompers. It was a destroyer tender. And it was it was wonderful duty. We had Seattle for a Liberty Port right across the harbor and and but it was boring duty. And I one day I was in uh <clears throat> I was uh on the pier standing in line waiting to use a telephone and I was kind of admiring this ship right next right near the phone booth and I thought, gosh I'd love to get on that little ship. So I watched this fella come off, and I, he was a black third-class boatsman, mate, the same rate as I was. And he got in line with us, and I got to visiting with him, and I, I told him what a nice ship it was. And he said, and he said, yeah, we're ready to deploy. And we got to visiting, and I said, well, you know, how much I'd like to be on her. And he got really excited. He said, well, I'd love to stay here in Seattle. He was newly married and didn't want to leave his bride. So we put in paperwork to swap duty stations, which wasn't real unusual. We were both the same rank and same time in service and everything. And I got called to our division officer's office and, and on the ship. And he said, sorry, we can't approve the transfer because you don't have a secret clearance. And I didn't give it much thought at the time, but why, why would this third class boatsman mate on this little ship have a secret clearance? But on that day I saw the, on the bulletin board, I noticed that they were looking for volunteers for river, river patrol boat personnel on, for the mobile riverine force. So I volunteered for that and that's how I that's how I ended up going back to Vietnam on the river boats. But to finish up my story about the little ship, um, it was a USS Pueblo. Hmm. Oh, it was it was really an irony in how sometimes fate works. Uh, I I look back on that uh, when I was flying back from leave after training with the river boats right at the end of uh, January when they announced that the North Korea had captured the Pueblo, and I thought, whew, how close that was. You, you, could, have, you could have been on that. I could have been on that, yeah. Huh. yeah. How did you get to Vietnam? We tra Well, when I, I uh, volunteered for the riverboat duty, we went through about a three-month training program, uh, which we, we graduated from the class in late January 1968. Uh, we, f we flew out of Travis Air Force Base in California up to Alaska, 
Uh, we got caught in this blizzard there actually and grounded for three days. Uh, when we did get out of Alaska, we landed in Okinawa and it was the actual opening day of the Tet Offensive of 1968 when we landed in Okinawa. So we ended up there for about four or five days before we could catch a flight into Saigon, into Tonsonut. And we finally got to Tonsonut, ended up staying there for a couple days. We weren't high priority to get down to the Mekong Delta where our river boats were. Uh, about the third or fourth day we did catch some helicopters down to the Delta and went our boats came in from operations and the crews were just, I remember how they were so terribly fatigued. They had been up running nonstop. For, what, what were they doing? Well, just trying to stop the communists and during the Tet Offensive when the, the whole South Vietnam, the, the communist insurrection, was, they were the insurgency, they were trying to have the general population rebel against the South Vietnamese government and the Americans. and. Uh, it, it was a moral success for them. It turned the media in the U.S. against the war. And, and uh, in reality, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong took a terrible, terrible toll, much worse than uh, South Vietnamese and Americans. But that's where, our, that's where the boats were all, um, just fighting the Tet battles. So now you left, and, and then you were assigned to the boat. You flew in, and then how'd you get to the boat because it was close by? We flew into Dong Tam, which is a naval base in the Mekong Delta. It's right on the Mekong River. Um, we were there for maybe three days before our boats came back in from their operations they were on. And I will always remember watching it come cruising in to, to the beach right in front of us. We were standing right on the beach watching it as it cruised in. and. It dropped the ramp because it was an old landing craft, World War II landing craft. Now describe that boat for me. That's the boat, yep, right there. Okay. Um, they Quick dropped time. the ramp and this this platoon of troops came off and they were so terribly worn out. They, they walked like a bunch of old, old men, just completely beat. Um, well, tell, tell me more about this boat. This is, looks like a World War II landing craft. Our, our boats were World War II landing craft. Um, what they did, they, they retrofitted them with two 50 caliber gun turrets, two 50 caliber machine gun turrets. And on the early craft, uh, we had, uh, we called them Honey, Honeywell grenade launchers, and they were hand operated. You'd crank the, you'd literally crank it like a meat grinder, and I believe it would, one revolution would put out three 40 millimeter grenades, just like the M79 uh, handheld. They looked like the big shotguns. Uh, but we had one port, one starboard, and then elevated and just behind that we had a 20 millimeter cannon. Uh, down in the well deck where the troops were, there were four 30 caliber machine guns, and that was manned, those were manned by the troops when we were carrying them when we'd get in ambushes. <clears throat> Our crew, we had a seven man crew, we had a boat captain, I was, I drove the boat, I was the coxswain, I was second in command. We had the 250 caliber machine gunners. We had a 20 millimeter machine gunner. We had a radio man. The radio man shared the coxswain flat with me. That's coxswain flat is where the helm and all the controls for the boat are. An engine man <clears throat> that was in charge of maintenance of the boat, the mechanical and electrical functions of the boat. So that was, that's what our seven man. Okay. Once you departed the docks. Where were the docks at? The boat was kept at. Well, generally, we didn't tie up to docks. They just beach them on the sh on the bay. Okay. Yeah, we didn't tie up to docks. Um, out in the main river, we had we referred to them as mother ships, the Benelon, the Colton. They were uh, supply ships and barracks ships. Uh, the Colton had medical facilities on it, and they had the big pontoons, ammy barges, they were called, tied up. They were tied permanently to the t sides of these ships and we would in turn in our small boats would connect to those pontoons. So you, you didn't have to walk through the mud to get on the boat? No. You go to a small boat to the mothership and then get on? That's correct. Now you proceeded north on the Mekong. What was the objective? What was the mission? <clears throat> our mission to be there, we were attached to the 9th Infantry Division, 2nd Brigade in the 9th Infantry. 
And if you look at the map of the Mekong Delta, it's only about two feet above sea level. And the main mode of transportation is the river and canal system. And so we, the, the military figured out in the early 60s that the South Vietnamese Navy was not able to stop the, government, the communist insurrection. And that's why the Mobile Riverine Force was formed. <clears throat> and we, we worked very closely with, uh, with the Army. Um, our main mission was we'd load the troops up and we'd take them up into the little canals. Whose troops? Tributaries. Ours or Vietnam, Vietnamese troops? Uh, our, our U.S. troops, okay. about 90% of the time. Once in a while we'd haul um, Vietnamese, once in a while Korean troops, but almost exclusive it was. And you um, took them up the Mekong to go where? We control. would take them up the Mekong, and, and if you look at a map, there's thousands of miles of tributaries and canals off the Mekong. We never really operated on the main river that much. We were always up in the canals and tributaries. Um, Why? Why? Looking because for... that was, that's where the enemy was. That's so where you were enemy. looking for camps? or Looking for, for camps uh, more often than not. <clears throat> we what triggered our contact was the ambushes because they knew we were coming. They, the Viet Cong had an excellent intelligence network. Um, we were kind of sitting ducks on the river. Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, now, once the boat's up the river and you have a crew of army people, you can't, how do you get them off to go after the ambush people or don't you for a while? When we were on operations, we, there were the officers <clears throat> would always have their, their operations all planned out and everything right down to the minute of where they were going to coordinate <laughs> their, their movements and whatnot. And I don't think they often went according to plan. But um, what we would normally do is go up the river and, and offload the troops in their designated points. Um, and what we do is I, I drive on the be onto the beach, I run the, the bow of the boat up onto the beach, lower the ramp, just like you see in the movies when they're offloading on Omaha Beach, for example, or Iwo Jima, I'd lower the ramp of the boat and the troops would go ashore and, <laughs> and fan out. And what we would do then is, we would act more often than not as a blocking force and the army troops would make a sweep around, try, you know, looking for the bad guys, and we would block their escape from trying to cross the river. So you, the boat would stay in place then until they came back? We generally would patrol a sector. Our boats would oh. spread out. If there would be a, a squadron of us. There would be about a dozen boats on an operation usually. And there were different types of boats. I was on an armored troop carrier. Our main purpose was to transport the troops. We had a, a monitor and, and it was compared to the battleship. It was much heavier armored. It had a <clears throat> 81 millimeter mortar, had a 40 uh, millimeter cannon, fa uh, uh, rapid fire cannon. Uh, so they were, and again, they had the same machine gun armament. We had the 50s and the 20s, but they were more designed to sit and slug it out. So you had a lot, it wasn't just you, you had a lot of boats going up the tributary. That's correct. And how did you know where to pick up the troops there? Radio or you have a designated spot? Well, there was designated spots, but again, we were always in radio contact also. Was that VHF or HF radio? Any, any idea? I honestly don't know. Just radio, radio contact. I, I honestly Okay, so, so once the troops are picked up, you bring, bring them back down river to the base of operations? That's basically, we usually we'd be out on, on two to three day operations. Um, <clears throat> so we'd offload the troops, we wouldn't see them again. It would be, like I say, two to three day sweep before they'd come back. Uh, if they got in heavy contact, uh, they'd more often than not be medevaced out by helicopter rather than us hauling them because we were so much slower. When you were on these trip tributaries, was the, was the water deep or extremely shallow? depend on time of the year. After the monsoon seasons, there okay. were additional hundreds and hundreds of miles of river, thousands of miles of rivers and channels that we could get up into. Um, but in the, during the dry season, it was somewhat limited. Okay. And during the monsoon, heavy current then? Heavy current. If 
if our boats were very slow. We had two 671 marine diesels that powered our boats. And if you were driving into an ebb tide and against the current, you would only be making, if you were fully loaded with a platoon of troops, you might be going three to four miles an hour, you know, about three knots if you're doing good. How do you get out of harm's way at that speed? Uh, you don't. You, you sit and slug it out. So what did you have for armament on the boats? Steel, Kevlar, or what? We had, well, we all wore our flake jackets and helmets. Made, um, made of what? They, they, at that time, they had, I believe they were like heavy nylon shields okay. sewn into, stitched into the nylon. And it was basically a vest. Um, but our boats had one-inch armor plating. Uh, as a driver of the boat, I, it was, some people compared our boats to floating tanks because I had, like, where I was, I had one-inch slits in my armor, and that was my view of the world. Well, you know, slits, two slits in the front armor plate, and then on each side I had two slits, and that was that was my view of the world. So, but you could stand up and look over if you wanted to. Oh, no, 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 because I, no, the armor was higher than me, and then I had a canvas awning over me. Okay. Um, but offset from that one-inch armor was what we referred to as bar armor, and it was basically re-rod re -rod welded about inch and a half, two inches apart. And it was designed to detonate rockets before they struck the armor plating. Because when the rocket struck the armor, it was uh, just a horrendous concussion, even if it didn't penetrate. Um, and it's interesting watching the Humvees and the, the personnel carriers today in Afghanistan. You'll see that bar armor, and I yeah. think that's a carryover from what we first started using on the boats. With the flak jacket on, you're working on high temperatures and high humidity. Mm -hmm. It was it would be just horrendously hot in the in the cocks and flat out. You know, with the armor plating up, and it would during the dry season especially. It was so hot. I kept a rag in the right by my helm there to wipe the sweat off the helm and the, and the shift levers because it'd get slick with sweat just dribbling off and and you just drank so much water and I didn't, I never liked the Kool-Aid packets they had so I just drank the water. <laughs> so how many months did you spend on on this boat? I got on, I arrived on the boat, we got the boat in I want to say February 2nd or 3rd of 1968 and I was on that <clears throat> till August 18th 1968. I was wounded in the ambush and met a back. Back what co wounded on the boat? I was wounded on the boat. <clears throat> Where we, was the boat when they got attacked? We were on uh, on uh, uh, just going up Kai Bay Canal, and it was a it was just a typical operation. We had a platoon of troops on board. Um, uh, we were just we were. It was a very narrow canal, actually. Maybe I would guess two hundred and fifty feet wide, maybe. Oh, wow. And I had. Two, I want to say two boats in front of me and I watched the first one just literally get blown sideways. They used a lot of rockets. They were Russian made rockets mostly, B-40s and RPG-7s uh, and uh, 57 recoilless rockets. Um, but I watched the boat in front of me literally just get pushed sideways and, and then we were kind of in the heart of the kill zone. We took a couple of rockets, um, three rockets right up in front and that, that they detonated on the canvas awning that was right above the troops and it just showered the platoon of troops we had and, and with shrapnel and pretty much incapacitated that whole platoon within seconds. Um, but there was a, there was a uh, bunker built into the riverbank just adjacent. I could see it firing just outside the, out the slit of my side armor and I turned the boat and plowed into the bunker thinking that I at least got rid of it and um, <clears throat> I didn't as I turned found out 35 40 years later but we we the by then machine gun fire was pouring in on us from both sides and uh, uh, with it I went to drop the ramp and it wouldn't go down the, the engineer the engineman was supposed to release the safety latch and he didn't but uh, Army sergeant stuck his head up to the coxswain flat and said just to back off because there was no one left to put ashore. 
and so I did and, and everything was awfully mixed up. It happened so fast. But within five minutes we took seven rockets and just countless rounds of machine gun fire and whatnot. Um, How'd you get out back out? I, I backed the boat off. We actually kind of broached the, in those few moments I was when I rammed the bunker, the, the boat, because there was an outgoing current, and it pushed the boat sideways, and it was kind of ironic. The uh, rocket came in and kind of broke us loose, the back of the boat knocked us loose a little bit, and I got back out in the river, and um, uh, two rockets hit right by the cocks and flat, and these... These Viet Cong, I have to say, were excellent shots. They were really, they stood their ground. And uh, the fir one of the first rockets that hit the coxswain flat busted the bar armor, knocked the bar armor aside. And the second one actually burned through the armor plating into the, into the compartment I was in. And it's the incongruities of, of uh, combat or war are just unexplainable. Um, that rocket, had it come in from a little different angle, would have killed me and the radium, and I'm sure, because that's normally what happened. But as it, as it was, it came in at a little bit of an angle, and it literally ricocheted right around us, the force of it ricocheted right around us. We both got wounded, naturally, but uh, we, were, we were so lucky. We were just so lucky. Okay, a few minutes after I, the rocket wounded me, uh, we had another rocket penetrate the 50 caliber gun turret and you can see the hole in the armor plating and you can you can see the the armor slits that's the same view that I had from the coxswain flat and this is what the gunners had to see also uh, and this this man uh, he was he was a, this fella that got wounded in this gun turret was truly a hero our our navy gunner our navy gunner uh, abandoned his post. He ran below and an army sergeant came up and manned this gun turret and he was in there maybe two minutes when this rocket penetrated this gun turret and it really, it it did catch him and, and really uh, he was severely wounded, severely wounded. Yeah. When we first went on board our boats we spent the first month about in the Mekong Delta and the Quezon Offensive up on i uh, right along the DMZ, was going full bore. And there was a river, it was called the Quaviet River. And it's just a couple miles south of the DMZ. And it was a, one of the supply routes um, for getting supplies to the Marines. And they couldn't keep that river open, so they transferred a division of our boats up there. Um, we arrived there in early March, I believe it was March 2nd, 1968. Three days after we got there, one of our boats, I was following it, one of our boats hit a mine, flipped it over and killed uh, five of the seven men on, no, six of the seven men on it. Uh, that was that was our worst loss actually all the time I was there. But that was a, we were up on a, up on the Quaviet River for about four months and it was a, it was a really, tumultuous time. Um, we would often get a, get uh, incoming artillery fire, especially at night. We'd go out near the mouth of the river and that's where we'd, we'd beach and spend the night. And the North Vietnamese would shell the base and I used to just, and a lot of us used to just kind of shake our head. The LSTs, the, Na the US Navy LSTs had come into this big ramp and they'd offload cargoes and it'd be sitting there on the ramp waiting to be hauled up to Donga, which was inland about eight miles. And it was from there was flown up into Quezon. But it seems like the North Vietnamese would wait for that ramp to get that offloading area to be filled with supplies. And then they'd, they'd spend the night dropping artillery on us. And a couple times, well, I guess more than a couple times, I got caught ashore during the artillery barrages, and that was that was pretty terrifying. Yeah. So, what, how much time did you spend on the Mekong? Well, we were up in we were up north for about four months, and and uh, then we were sent back down to the Mekong. We they, what they did they loaded our ships onto LSDs, landing ship docks, and I as I recall, we could get six in there. When we returned to the Mekong, uh, it was 
early July and we went quickly soon after we got back we went on an operation down into the Yumin forest and that was a prolonged that was a 10 day operation 10 or 12 days and that was the longest operation that I ever went on. And with, with a boat you're talking about? With the you? boats, yeah. There was, as I believe, there was two divisions of boats that went And where on. is this again? It's the Yumin Forest is the very southern part of South okay. Vietnam. Okay. Um, they said we were the first foreign troops there since the French had left in 1954. And so it was a stronghold for the Viet Cong. Uh, they had... They had uh, R&R sites there, training camps, uh, POW camps. They felt very secure down there. And it was pretty amazing from, we were down there, like I say, it was a 10-day operation. Uh, the Army, I don't recall, the, the Navy boats really uh, didn't get in heavy contact. Snipers, we got in a couple of little ambushes on the way out. But during that 10-day operation, the Army did horrendous amount of damage to the Viet Cong infrastructure, the military donor. And from what I've read in the, in the history uh, after action reports, there were no American casualties. That, that was pretty phenomenal. Um, when we came out, because it took about, as I recall, from the Mekong, we got on a, on a big tributary in Canto and went south. And it took, I want to say, 10 or 12 hours to transfer, transfer that, that route. And we came up to Canto, which is a, a big city village, on right at the mouth of this river we were coming out of, back onto the Mekong, and we got in a pretty bad ambush there. Uh, and and uh, we were towing army barges because when we get beyond uh, fixed fire support for the army, they had these these uh, howitzers on barges that would be towed along with our river boats. And when we were in Canto returning, these, these howitzers on the army barges ended up firing right into the town. I, I do remember that. And that was, Which town? It was Canto. 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 And that was, that was in, um, that would have been the late part of July of 68. Yeah. When the operation was over with, where the Navy put you, when you left these boats, where did you go? When you left the river, when you left this river boat, where did you go? I, well, I was medevac back. Medevac because you got injured? Because I had been wounded, yeah. yeah. Um, when I got wounded on August 18th, 1968, I was medevac to the USS Colleton, which was one of our mother ships in the main Mekong. And I, I spent maybe a day there, and they did some, some just uh, a little surgery on me and whatnot. And then they sent me to uh, 3rd Army Field Hospital, I believe it's called, in Tonsonu. And I was there for two days, I believe. And, and one, of the, one of the things that happened to me besides getting the shrapnel is my eyes got burned because I had my face right up against the armor slits trying to assess the, di the damage at the front of the boat. And a rocket detonated right below where my face was and the flash kind of burned my eyes and uh, I didn't realize, I don't think anyone did until about the third day I started going blind and that was really terrifying. Um, so I was, they wrapped my eyes when I was in Tonsonu and then I got medevac to Japan to an army hospital. I was there at, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the hospital right offhand, but I was there for about eight days and then medevac back to uh, Great Lakes Naval Hospital. And Great Lakes, the Chicago area. Great Lakes, north of Chicago. Yeah, yeah that was kind of an interesting situation. <clears throat> we flew, we flew from from Tokyo, Tachikawa Air Force Base, I believe it was in Japan. We flew from there to Alaska, and and it was a super fortress. Is that what it's called? I oh, can't remember the name of the. Um, but I remember. They had taken the bandages off my eyes by then, and, and I was able to see pretty decent. And I always remember sitting backwards on this big medevac plane, and, and they had these pallets of coffins uh, that we all sat watching and looking at for many, many hours as we flew over the Pacific. But they in in Alaska, they split us up and to the west coast and to the mid-east, or the 
his yeah. last rather. And uh, we flew on from, from Fairbanks, I think, down to Glenview Naval Air Station. First we went to Scott, which is in southern Illinois, and then they moved us, they flew us up to Glenview Naval Air Station. Well, we landed at Glenview late in the afternoon, I remember, and, and uh, they offloaded us onto ambulances and, and uh, Gray Navy buses. And <coughs> we pulled out, we pulled out of the 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 base off the gates of outside the gates of Glenview and and uh, our buses were attacked by protesters and they were they were pretty vicious they were beating on our buses and throwing whatever rocks bricks eggs you know whatever crap at us and and for years that really troubled me we it only lasted for a few minutes because the buses pulled through it and we went up to Great Lakes and. And I spent a few months in the hospital, and then when I got discharged, they sent me to the VA hospital down in Chicago. But um, for many years, that, that why the protesters attacked us really troubled me. And several years ago, I was taking a, a, a writing conference at Bemidji State University, and I had this professor that I submitted the chapter about the protesters. And he said to me, when he read it, he said, protesters would never act like that. They were nonviolent. My parents were protesters. They never would have done something like that. And it, <clears throat> it really troubled me because I, I thought, here's this young professor. He, he's so biased that, you know, here he's teaching his, his version of revisionist history to, to a generation of students that don't have a clue of what was going on. And after the conference, I spent several weeks, it just was gnawing at me. So my wife and I drove down to Chicago and I spent the day try, doing some research. And, and what I discovered was actually pretty amazing. <coughs> Uh, the, <clears throat> the afternoon that we landed at Glenview was the height of the Democratic National Convention protests down in, in downtown Chicago. And the military had flown in several hundred army troops to Glenview Naval Air Station to back up Richard Mayor Richard Daly's police force. And the protesters were very well organized. They had uh, this group of them to block the army troops that they knew were at Glenview. And when these, when these buses pulled, these Gray Navy buses pulled off the, off the base, they just assumed that they were army troops heading south. And it was interesting because I, I went to the Glenview uh, library, public library, and I went through the archives and microfiche of, of the old newspapers and, and I picked up the date, August 29th, 1968, and the first thing I had was this picture of, of stacked rifles, and, and I read the article, and I realized exactly what had happened. Well, a few weeks before I went down, I, I had contacted the Glenview, uh, Naval, uh, the Glenview Historical Society and visited with this lady, Bev, and explained what I was searching for. And Bev had been a nurse during the Vietnam War, and so after I was done at the library, I went over to the Historical Society, uh, Historical Center, and I was their guest for the day. But she had done some research, and she had come to the exact same conclusion. And we, we visited. There's quite a few retired military around Glenview, and several of them came by. And it was a nice afternoon. We spent just kind of reminiscing about that era. And late in the afternoon, this lady came in and... and uh, we told her what we were talking about, and she said, I remember that day. She says, I remember those protesters. I was a second grade teacher. She says, I was trying to get home from work. So, but what happened, it, <clears throat> it, it turned out to be a, a positive experience having gone through that with a professor because I, I wrote an article for this history magazine called Vietnam, put out by a Widener History Group. And I, I quoted this professor's critique of my essay quite, quite extensively, and I wanted his permission to use it in this article. And 
So I sent the SAIO to uh, Steve Almond, and Steve read it and gave me his permission. And at that point, <clears throat> he offered to write the foreword for my book. Well, that was my next question. What, where did the idea come from for a book? Does it, does it happen here at this moment? No, oh no. Um, I, I give credit to the old World War II vets that they they kind of inspired me to write the book. Um, How long ago did you have these thoughts about the book? I knew that I wanted to tell a story. While you were and, in NAM? No, 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 After. no, I, no. If you go on Amazon, you'll see my daughter talks. Uh, I didn't talk about this for over 30 years. Um, but I ran a butcher shop on, and that's what I did for uh, 30 years. I worked in a meat business. Okay. And in the 90s, these World War II vets started coming in, and they knew I had been in Vietnam, because I had been commander of the local VFW. And, and what town is this in? Pardon? What town? This is in Bemidji, Minnesota. Okay. Um, VFW Post 1260, I was commander of for a couple of years. But <coughs> these World War II vets started coming in. Not a lot of them, but a few, over the years, several of them. And, and they started telling me a story of their trauma during the war. And more often than not, they'd walk away shaking their head, choked up, teary-eyed more than once. And I, you know, I, at that time, I didn't give it a lot of thought. But it, it must have been in my subconscious because I started thinking about, I need to tell my story before I'm gone because these old guys were on their way out. And I was, I was very fortunate. I met this, uh, she, I didn't know it at the time, Susan Carroll Hauser was <clears throat> the chair of the English department at Bemidji State University. And she'd come in the store shopping and I, I told her one time, I said, Susan, I think I have stories to tell, but I, I need to learn how to write. <laughs> Susan suggested that I take a class with Mark Christensen, a professor at Bemidji State University. And so <clears throat> I retired in 2001. And that autumn I, I took a writing class with Mark. And, and um, Mark was, boy, he was just so understanding. And he empathized with what I wanted to do. And <clears throat> he, he listened. He was patient. And, you think, when I joined the Navy, I was 17, I dropped out of school, and so I hadn't set foot in, <laughs> <laughs> in a chance. classroom for many decades. So I was I was pretty nervous when I first started, but Mark was so supportive, and, and one, one semester led to another, and I took, I started taking many classes, philosophy and history, and, and I discovered poetry. And, and um, somewhere along the way, I discovered World War I poets, uh, Robert Graves and uh, Wilfred Owen, and uh, uh, they, Siegfried Sassoon. And I, I love the tone of their poetry, the, the loss and the waste of war. And so a lot of my, a lot of my, my manuscript was written early in the morning, and I... <clears throat> I'd go upstairs in our house and I'd sit and read their poetry for an hour and it, it just really set the tone of what I was trying to do because I, I absolutely did not want to glorify war. And I, when I started having people read, I said, if you ever see anything in here where I'm glorifying war or making anyone sound heroic, I want to know about it because that's the last thing in the world that, that I want to do. Yeah. So I, did you start the book then when you were going to school or after? You know, uh, for several years I took classes because I basically needed to learn the craft. I, I, okay. You know, I had spent my career being a butcher. And so I started writing essays from just my memory essays, I call them. And this went on for maybe three years and, and these essays started accumulating quite a few of them. You didn't give them to anybody? Uh, oh, I shared them with the classes, you okay. know, because you'd pass, you exchange work to critique and whatnot. And people started telling me, you need to make this into a book. And I thought, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Well, it kept going, and, and um, 
uh, a couple of grad students took serious looks at it and this one uh, Tammy said she said put this in chronological order uh, you need to she said you this could be a book and so I did what she suggested I, I read um, I started studying some memoirs and biographies Stephen Ambrose's uh, Undaunted was a good example uh, of I thought you know I could do something like this and so I, I rearranged things chronologically and I discovered the uh, website where I could pull up after action reports and that was I started doing research then um, and that was a huge step forward for me with the research and having these after action reports I was able to put the dates accurate then and so I started adding a lot of depth. I took this class, <clears throat> uh, History of the Vietnam War, with Professor Tom Murphy at Bemidji State University, and, and I kind of sat quiet in the beginning of the class because he had a different perspective than I did a little bit. And, but I realized, you know, I was learning another point of view of that era the protesters point of view and and when I in my writing we, our, our radio man on our boat was a college graduate and he was anti-war and he was vocal about it and in my early essays my early pieces that I wrote he was he was a very quiet character he didn't have a lot to say well after this history of the Vietnam War class I realized he would be a perfect vehicle to reveal the conflict that was on our boat and the conflict that was going on back in the United States. And so I did a major rewrite on the manuscript and that added really a lot of depth to it. Yeah. But, but I, I took a lot of writing workshops in between semesters and during the summer. That's a, during the, a summer conference is when I had met that professor, Steve Allman. Uh, and it just, it, the book just slowly evolved, um, many, many... When did you finish the book? What year? I finished the book, I suppose, 2009. And I, 2009, I pretty much, it had been professionally edited, um, so it was pretty darn clean, but in January 2010, my mother died, and I was her probate administrator, and that was time-consuming, so... I just put the manuscript on a, on a shelf upstairs and um, I discovered a, an incredible story after my mother died that I started uh, archiving her history and whatnot. Um, and I started writing her story and I had a few hundred pages written. But this Vietnam manuscript was just bugging me in the back of my mind. <laughs> and I, I decided one day I need to just get it published and, and uh, be done with it. And so I'm very, very fortunate. I, our daughter has TJ Design Studio here in Bemidji, Minnesota, and she's just a great uh, group that she works with. And I give her, come, her and her, her helpers just full credit for getting that manuscript off the shelf and into the bookstores. I, I assume you delivered this in electronic form. I, I delivered, yep, yeah. I, I gave it to TJ Design Studio as a Word document. Um, they converted to a PDF uh, document and, and did the, all the formatting and everything. Um, we, I put all the pictures together. They did the cover design and everything on the, on oh, the, really? on the book, yep. Yeah. When, when I first started, I, you have no idea, especially I self-published. Um, say that right up front. Um, now that means what? Well I, I tried to go the traditional route. I sent out query letters trying to find a literary agent and, or a publisher and I quickly realized that nobody was going to publish an unknown from northern Minnesota. And so I started exploring the self-publishing route and it self-publishing companies are often referred to as vanity presses where you pay them a fee up front and, and their their services are really all over the board and but I spent a lot of time studying them and every time I read about one and study them I learned quite a bit and I as I as I was studying I after several months I came to the conclusion you know what 
I can do this myself. And so I think the first the first thing I, I got was was uh, I got my I applied with the Library of Congress and I applied for my copyright and I got my ISBN numbers and your bicycle code it's a code that you see on the back of the book that where it's positioned in bookstores what what spot it's in and all the technical data that goes with with assembling the front matter of a book but as I as I went through this process I just kept links you know I'd save the links of the different uh, organizations I went to well a couple of months later I had five pages of links well uh, TJ Design Studio put everything together, and they. My I first used Create Space, which is a print-on-demand publisher. Uh, they're affiliate of Amazon, and they're just, in my opinion, they're they're just a great great operation for a self-publishing author because they're they're flexible. Um, they're not. They don't charge huge fees. The writer main, retains a hundred percent of your rights. So you have you maintain full control of your art, um, but what I came to realize pretty quick, I was selling quite a few books, and I thought there's got to be a better way to go. Well, we get this little newsletter called Bottom Line, and one I think it comes every two weeks, and there was an article in Bottom Line about self-publishing because self-publishing today is actually a very uh, legitimate way to go publishing a book. And there was this long article about self-publishing and bottom line, and I'm reading about this big operation in Colorado and another one in California, and they mentioned this Bang Printing in Brainerd, Minnesota. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll be darned. I'm going to check Brainerd, Minnesota out. So I called my daughter's office, and, and we made an appointment, and we went, Kim and I went down to Brainerd and... and uh, had a meeting with a lady from Bang, Pub, Bang Printing, and um, as it turns out, we had them print 2,500 books for us. They did just a great job, uh, just excellent support. And so I started, you know, I started selling my books direct. I closed my Create Space account because originally, what would happen when my book was on Amazon, Amazon would get an order and they'd send it'd just be transferred to create space and they print the book and ship it out to the buyer. And so once I once I pre-printed these books through Bang Printing, I closed create space down now I ship Amazon books direct and so they have them in their inventory which really works out great for me. Now, when you go to sell your books, how do you decide who's going to handle it? How do you how do you get it out to the public? How do you make them aware that your book is here? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> our community, Bemidji, has been just so supportive. Um, I, I applied for this grant. Again, I go back to Susan Carroll Hauser, who first introduced me to the writing world. Um, Susan suggests I apply for this grant, this artist grant, with Bemidji Community Art Center, and I did, and I, I was awarded it, and I, I designated that I was going to use the grant funds for marketing. And so I, I purchased three ads, in fact there's still one to run yet, with a, a New York Review of Books. And the reason I did that, I thought this Steve Allman that did the foreword is quite a well-known uh, author on the East Coast, and I thought maybe I'll catch the eye of some of his audience. I saw some spike in my Amazon sales, not huge, and uh, so that was that part of the grant, but but what I discovered locally, our, our local library has been just excellent promoting me. Um, where I used to work in a butcher shop, Lucan's Village Foods. That's where I did my first book signing <clears throat> um, Memorial Day of 2011, just a few months after it came out. And it, it's just, this whole community has been so great. And you were at the fairgrounds when she was here. That's where I met you. Was that the first met, time? That was my first, we met at Clearwater County Fair, and that was my first fair that I attended. And it was it was an amazing experience. I had read in a, in a uh, publishing magazine that fairs were a great uh, uh, venue for regional authors. And I thought, well, I'll try it out. 
and it was it was really amazing the the response we sold quite a few books but what was more interesting to me and really more important were the connections that I made and the people that I met. Um, that's where I met David Quam, who's <laughs> filming this. And it, it was just, it was, I won an airplane ride there in a raffle. It was just a great week. But then the following week I did Beltrami County Fair and, and uh, again, just a great response. One of the things that was interesting with my book, and it, it surprised me because it's a war book, a Vietnam War memoir, is I probably sell more books to women than I do men. That's interesting. It, it really, it, it struck me the first time I was down in Dorset, Minnesota, doing a book signing, and I realized, why, why do I have all these women? And I started listening to their comments and it, well, this is for my brother or this is for my father or this is for my father-in-law. Mm. You know, and so many, <clears throat> so many Vietnam vets, they, they kind of still shy away from, you know, reading about the war or discussing it. And it's kind of where I was for quite a few decades. Yeah. Yeah. That's a marvelous story. And I'm, I'm delighted to be part of it, to be able to tell this story. Well, I'm honored that you have been able to come and do this. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Legacies of Honor is an, uh, a business that Michael Harris created. He and his wife put it together. Um, in, there were so many Vietnam veterans and, and others from other conflicts and wars that wanted a shadow box and, and Michael felt it important to make mm -hmm. sure... What's a shadow box? Shadow box is the, the, literally the box that holds the medals and uh, insignias and awards that a person has received. Uh, shadow box, quite often people see the flag in that after a funeral. Um, but Michael Harris and his wife formed this, the Legacies of Honor, in response to demands for uh, veterans wanting to kind of come out of the closet, you might say, with their, their memories and their awards. I know personally, I had a few, I threw in a drawer and it laid there for 35, 40 years, and, and uh, uh, I finally sent Michael my DD-214 and a couple other forms, my discharge papers. And and Michael, what I what I really impre was impressed with his operation. He took the time to verify all medals and all awards, and it, it, he really dug into it because there's so much fraud in this in this society today with wannabe veterans and whatnot. Um, what Michael does is authenticated, and that I I felt personally I, it added a level of of uh, value to my shadow box um, but I highly recommend if you're interested in exploring your past and having it put together for your family because it is truly a legacy <clears throat> to have Michael ex look into it, contact Michael. Um, Michael is the webmaster of our mobile riverine force. He was, in, he was served time in the Mekong Delta with the Navy and so he has a personal uh, connection with this whole thing. Michael is the historian for the Mobile Riverine Force Association and I asked him to fact check my manuscript and um, he, he's such a gentleman, he's, I'm sure he spent many hours going through it. He came up with some excellent suggestions um, concerning some armament and some memories that I had recorded at that um, I fact-checked, double-checked, and, and did change the manuscript, and, and I really did appreciate that. So, it, again, I just say thank you, Michael. Okay, that top patch that you're looking at is the insignia of the United States Navy uh, with the eagle and, and how'd, how'd the you sunrise. Wear, did you wear it on a uniform? Uh, never really wore it on uniforms. The first medal on your left is the Purple Heart Medal. I was awarded that for wounds I received in action in South Vietnam on August 18, 1968. Uh, the next medal is a National Defense Medal. Everybody receives that in boot camp. Uh, the next is a Vietnam Service Medal. 
uh, and I have one star on that. It from because I t served two tours, and a star in, signifies uh, uh, sig additional tours. And the medal on the right is a Vietnamese cross for gallantry, and that was a uh, uh, unit citation. Uh, they also had another one, and Michael explained to me in the, presenting this that in assembling this shadow box that there was another one that was awarded, I imagine similar to a bronze star for individual gallantry. The medal insignia is a Vietnam combat craft crewman insignia that was actually awarded much later, uh, I, I believe after, long after the Vietnam War was done. And it basically it has a PBR, a patrol boat river, one of the small fast craft that people see uh, like an apocalypse now. But this was awarded to all uh, riverine force sailors and, and any military personnel that served on the rivers in inland waters. Okay, the bars of ribbons are, um, they represent the medals? They represent some of the medals. Uh, the purple heart you can recognize. The, the second one, the middle one on the top row is actually quite significant. Uh, it's a combat action ribbon and it's equivalent to the um, Army Combat Infantry ba Infantryman badge. Uh, the Navy and Marine Corps kind of downplay it. They don't actually make a medal for it. They just use a ribbon and it's awarded to those who have been in combat. Um, and the rest are, are again um, pretty much unit wards that I received through my two tours of duty. Okay, this, bra this brass insignia is uh, that's an insignia that represents my rank. I was a second class boatswain mate, uh, which is an E5, and different, different branches of service have different uh, definitions of what the E5 is, but in the Navy it's a second class petty officer. Blue patch with the red chevrons and the crossed anchors. The crossed anchors are a designation of my specialty in the Navy. I was a boatswain mate, and the two chevrons represent that I was a second class petty officer and that I would wear on my uniform. Okay, this Mobile Riverine Force Mekong Delta insignia, to my knowledge it was not worn on any uniforms. It's something that as a civilian you would wear on jackets or sweaters or you'll see it on hats and whatnot. Who made the plate up? That's part of the shadow box. Michael Harris made that with Legacies of Honor. This came as a complete unit from him. Uh, it's just, it's very high quality and one of the nice things, I ordered the little larger shadow box because if I do want to add something in the future, I, for example, if I want to put a picture of the boat I served on in there or some other thing, memories for my, my children and grandchildren, they have room for it. This is a picture of our, of our armored troop carrier. Um, we beached it, we ran it up on the beach at high tide and, and as the tide went out, after it went out, we were able to scrape the hull and clean it up and look for some leaks that was under the well deck. This picture was taken while we were up on the Quaviat River just south of the demilitarized zone in Vietnam. This is a picture of our boat captain, Buddha Ed Thomas III. Uh, he's guarding a Viet Cong suspect that the Army turned over to us while we were on a Yumin operation in July of 1968. The Yumin forest was a very southern part of South Vietnam. I'm standing on periphery there in sunglasses and helmet kind of watching. This is a picture of our Quaviat naval base just at the mouth of the Quaviat River. Um, LSTs would come in and offload cargo on the big concrete ramp there and it seemed like the North Vietnamese waited till the ramp was piled high with supplies and then they'd open up with their artillery and as you can see here they, they scored a bullseye and I, if this may have happened like March 13, 1968, they shelled that base continuously for over 24 hours. This is a picture of me, I'm just 20 years old here, I'm standing on a catwalk, catwalk of our, our armored troop carrier and this was our typical uniform of the day here. It would be so hot, um, usually didn't wear a t-shirt, uh, shorts, and I quite often went barefoot. Again, this is me uh, during the, the uh, uh, Yumin forest operation. We're in the very southern part of, North, of South Vietnam, 
and were beached waiting for army troops to return from a sweep they're on and we had we were near a little hamlet and some Vietnamese children came aboard to explore boat and I was visiting with them there. This is our armored troop carrier on, on August 18th, 1968. This, this is actually a scene of where of the rockets that penetrated the Coxon Flat where I was that wounded me. Uh, these Viet Cong were, they really stood their ground that day. Uh, one rocket hit the, the bar armor that surrounded the Coxon Flat the re-rod that you can see, and then the second one came through the opening the first one made and burned through the armor plating and wounded myself and the radio men that I shared the compartment with the Cox plant. This is another angle of the same shot. You can see the, the tail fins of the rockets just sitting there, that little round circle is uh, where the tail fins are connected to the, rock, the spent rocket. Within minutes after those rockets penetrated the Coxon flat, um, we had another one that burned through this 50 caliber machine gun turret and severely wounded an army sergeant that was in the, in the turret. This, is af this shot was, well, they, all the shots were taken after the ambush naturally, but these were the first rockets that hit the boat. We had a full platoon of, of troops, army troops on board that we were going to beach and the first rockets in the ambush struck the canvas awning that you see all ripped up and it three rockets hit one up front and one kind of midships and the third one just below at the very back of the of the uh, canvas awning and it, the shrapnel showered down on the troops and it literally incapacitated a full platoon of army troops within about four seconds when i got wounded in 1968, I was medevaced out and never had a chance to say goodbye. Mm. <clears throat> you send me your buddies here? This is our boat captain. Which one is the boat captain, right or left? Um, the one on your right is Buddha Ed Thomas III. Okay. I reconnected with him in 1991. A, a local friend came back from a, a VA hospital with a flyer for a mobile marine force association. Reunion. What happened to the flag here? See, it's tore up at the that, bottom. That is a flag that our boat captain, Buddha, returned, brought home with him from our boat. Okay, um, who's the gentleman on the uh, left? You know who that is? That's me on the left holding the flag with oh. him. We're, we're after Buddha retired, um, he moved to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, and um, that's he died several years ago. Now, where's that flag today? I have it. Oh, you can. This is another picture of our boat that we're, we're beached and uh, this again I'm sure it's up on the Quaviat River up north because of the there's just no jungle around like there was down in the south. This is a village on the Quaviat River. It was on the north side of the river. Uh, I don't remember the name of it but it, you can see it's been severely damaged. The Marines in the early part of 1968 went through some hellish combat along there. Um, Keith Nolan wrote a, a book called The Magnificent Bastards and it details the combat that went on during those boats and for any anyone interested in that I highly recommend it. Again this is another angle of our armored troop carrier 11211 that I was the coxswain on the boat driver and again I believe we're on the river up north here. I'm surprised we don't see any any crewmen aboard there. They're all tucked below. Is this, is this the landing craft used in World War II? These are LCM-6s, landing craft mechanized, that were used in World War II. Uh, they're surplus, the Navy took and, and retrofitted them. They put the armor plating on them and the gun turrets and whatnot. And the purpose of that was, it was especially for down in the Mekong Delta, because rivers and tributaries were the main routes of transportation down there, and that was the only way that the army troops could get into sanctuaries where the Viet Cong were. This is the the gun turrets of uh, armored troop carrier 11211. Three days after we got up to the Quaviat River, it struck a mine and it flipped over and it killed uh, all the crew except one. Killed six men. One survived. He was thrown overboard, uh, severely injured. This is our 20 millimeter cannon gunner. Um, he's in his gun mount. You can see he's holding on to the cocking lever there. It looks like he's ready for action. This is an M60 machine gun that uh, it, I retrieved this 
off a helicopter that got knocked down one night at Quaviette. A, a helicopter we were receiving incoming, our boat was out in the river just off the, the ramps and a helicopter went to take off and it hit a, a dredging boom that was sticking out. It, it was dark and some, uh, I think some uh, incoming round had landed nearby and a concussion had pushed the helicopter too close to the dredging boom. But we ran into the, into the shore and I ran up on the bank looking for if there was any survivors because everybody was pretty much in the bunkers on land. And I tripped over this M60 in the dark. There were no survivors. I grabbed the machine gun and ran back to our boat. And Where'd we, you find the ammo for it? Uh, well, we kind of had to hide this machine gun while we were up north because the Marines spent quite a few days sending divers looking for it because in the river they thought it had gone into the river. Once we got them back down to the Delta late in early July, then um, Buddha actually that was a symbol of his his authority kind of and and the ammo we it was readily available through the army for a, a bottle of Jack Daniels or whatever. <laughs> This is, this is my view of the world here. Um, looking through my armor plating, we're heading out on an operation, and this is a pretty typical width of the rivers. It's actually a little wider than a lot of them that we operated on. How deep? The depths varied. Um, our, the draft on our boat, as I recall, was around three and a half feet, four feet. And so generally, if it was less than five to six feet, we wouldn't even attempt to navigate it. So and the average depth is probably eight feet then, maybe? Pardon? The average depth? I, I doubt if it was that deep. Okay. And often right. it wasn't that deep. And a lot depended on the season and if the tide was in. Sure. Um, so there were variables. Okay, this is a, it's a different, it's called a monitor. It's compared, the Navy would compare it like to a, a battleship. As you can see, the heavier armament on it, it had a 40 millimeter cannon, and um, it, uh, oh, let's see here. Yeah, it had radar on it. It was, it, the other one that was identical to this almost was a um, uh, command. Command. It was a command boat, basically. Okay, All uh, the. Um, uh, what do you use the radar for? You know, a lot of times at night, if we were going on the on the dark rivers, you we use the radar to stay between the banks, and we had little um, uh, identification lights by the mast, and we changed different uh, different uh, sequence of lights, and that was basically like I'd just follow the light in front of me on dark rivers. Sometime you wouldn't be able to even see the banks. This is a shot. I, I'm thinking this is during the Yumin Forest operation because I can see some jungle in the background and. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. I'm wondering if maybe they, the uh, army was bringing some supplies in or if it was a shot from up north by the Quaviet River. During that combat time, they're picking up some uh, uh, marine casualties. This is a little uh, USO promotion that's going on on uh, pontoons that were tied up to the USS Banawa and you can See, it drew quite a large crowd. This looks like a, maybe a Filipino singing group, performing group. Um, it, we'd usually have a beer call with a couple cans of beer for each uh, sailor and, and soldier. What kind of ship was it? The Benno was a barracks ship. What's that mean? Storage from personnel? It, well, the army troops basically lived on that. This is another shot of our boats underway heading out on an operation. This is probably on the main Mekong River. You can see how wide it is. And during uh, these, this part of operations, we all felt pretty secure. There's, we're so far from the shores. Was it always a large contingency of boats going out at one time? There usually would be a, a, about a dozen of us. You, yeah. you, you wouldn't go out by yourself? Very seldom. Very seldom. Again, this is looks like we've just offloaded some troops, and maybe we're just getting underway here. You can usually we were spaced out at a, at about 50 to 60 yards apart, and this one you can see where some of the boats are pretty close together. This is a picture of our boat captain, Buddha Ed Thomas. He's sitting in his position when we would be in operations where we thought we'd <clears throat> have contact, get in trouble. Um, he, his position was between the two 50 caliber gun turrets. The 20 millimeter turret is behind him and my coxswain flat is just forward of him. And that, 
we would communicate just yelling back and forth to each other because I had a little opening between the canvas awning and, and the, the uh, armor plating that was behind me. And this is Buddha with his, his uh, cigar and cup of coffee. This is another picture of a monitor getting underway. You can see the additional weight that it has, see how, how close it is to the water line. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention on the first one, they had an 81 millimeter uh, mortar sitting in the pit behind the, the 40 caliber or the 40 millimeter machine gun and uh, that was very effective. This is, uh, this is uh, army troops returning to our boat. Uh, you can see how they're just kind of milling around. They know there's no danger in front of them, so I'm, I'm assuming they're returning. And they're just climbing aboard. You can't see the ramp on the boat because it's dropped right now. And these fellas, when they'd come back, they were just covered in mud from head to toe sometimes. This looks like an early morning shot. I, I'm guessing we're down in the delta here because I can see the tree line on the far side of the river. We might be in Dong Tam in a turning basin there in the boat basin, just getting underway. This is an a ASPB. Uh, they compared this to like to a destroyer. It was a lighter, uh, lightly armored boat, and it generally would lead our columns of boats when we went out on operations. Sometimes didn't make a lot of sense to me because they they took the, probably the highest casualties of the whole squadron. Why? Because they, for one thing, they were in the lead of the columns. Uh, again, they weren't heavily armored like we were. They were just more exposed. What was their function? Their function was mine sweep and, and just kind of because we were so much slower. The ASPBs were much faster than we were because they didn't have the armament and that they were just kind of our eyes for the column. Was there a big problem with mines in this shallow water? Mines were, when we were up north on Quaviet River, mines were the number one threat. Uh, down in the delta, the ambushes were the number one threat. There were many minings down there. Did, did, were these contact mines or somebody would set them off from the shore? There were different kinds. They were, uh, some were contact mines. Uh, often they were command detonated, which is where wires would be connected right. to the underwater mine and then set off by the person on shore. The mine that actually hit, uh, that destroyed Tango 7 up on the Quaviet River, they, they determined later it was a, a magnetic Russian-made mine and, and it was explained to me that it had a, a timing mechanism on it with a counter and it, it literally detonated when the 22nd boat passed over it. So I sometimes wonder how many times I drove over it before it hit that boat in front of me. This is a hamlet down in the Mekong Delta. You can see the thatch roof hooches. That's what we call the little houses they live in, uh, just hooches. And uh, it's a kind of a typical day for the people. You can see the clothes on the clothesline. There's kids out playing and, and uh, yeah. How guess, would you know if they're if they're VC or not? You didn't. You really didn't. Um, you know, most of the most of the people. I mean, if they didn't if they didn't run, you had to assume they were not enemy. I just wonder. In the lower right hand corner, there's a bunch of uh, there's several men squatting, and I wonder if outside that picture frame there isn't if they're not being held for interrogation or something. This is another shot of the hamlet that was down in uh, Yu Min and just a bunch of civilians checking us out. When we were down there, we were the first foreign forces that had been in that area since the French left in 1954. So there was a whole generation of Vietnamese children and uh, young people that had never seen outsiders. So they, they just came because they were curious? They were curious, yep. The ones on the boat there that I was visiting with, they were actually quite superstitious. Um, as I recall, you, you Vietnamese didn't like to be patted on the head. And I just reached out to, one was kind of rubbing on my tattoo on my arm, trying to wipe it off, because apparently he had never seen a tattoo. And I, just a little boy, I reached out to ruffle his hair and he jumped back like I was <laughs> a demon or something. This is, this is the back of our boat, a view from the back of it. Uh, each boat was customized with, with whatever the boat captain wanted to sound tough with. This one's Sat Kong, train killer, and that Sat Kong, as I recall, means kill Viet Cong. And you can see BM2, boat's mate, second class diver, Thomas. He was the boat captain. Uh, that's one of our 50 caliber gunners kind of squatting on the edge there. Uh, here it looks like we're just, you can see this is a narrow river. 
Uh, looks like we probably dropped off the troops and we're getting over underway to uh, separate into the different sectors we'd patrol while the troops were in inland making a sweep. This is a shot of Kai Bay. Um, we're, we're heading up into a canal, into a narrow river, and you can see how some of the buildings are on stilts built right into the river and a lot of the sand pans tied up to the wharfs alongside there.